Ah, uh, hello, you must be the new recruit. Well, welcome to your training, and let me be the first one to welcome you to the wonderful world of chivalry. This documentary, <coughs> sorry, this documentary on the design of Chivalry 2 could not come at a better time, as the issue of designing fun and accurate swordplay has come up in several of our recent documentaries on some of the most celebrated sword-based games ever made. In our docs on Thief the Dark Project, Dishonored, and most recently Deathloop, some of the most experienced designers in their field have talked to us about the difficulties of making swords work in first-person games. It's no wonder so many of them stick to guns. Take this standard video game weapon. You just point it at whoever it is you want to murder, and you press the button. Bang! And they're dead. And video game controllers are quite good at that, pointing at something and pressing a button. Swords, on the other hand, they're analog, and a lot more complicated. Yeah! In recent years, games like Mordow and Kingdom Come Deliverance have wrestled with this problem, but no team has more experience with the long metal swinging things than Torn Banner Studios, creators of the chivalry franchise that finds its design roots back in City 17. And while we're on the subject of turning the average keyboard warrior into a skilled foot soldier, we're also going to explore how Chivalry 2 attempts to focus the game's armies into working together for a common goal. Okay, that's quite enough chit-chat between old friends. How about we talk to the experts and uncover the design of Chivalry? Two. Chivalry 2. The second. Well, the third, there was a mod. <laughs> In 2007, Steve Piggott joined a Half-Life 2 modding group that was working on something near and dear to his heart, a game where swordplay was the focus. Over the course of the project's time, he eventually became team lead of Age of Chivalry, a mod that was attempting to add realistic melee combat to an engine that up to then was only good at swinging, well, crowbars. Generally what games do for melee is they just have like a large box, they don't really care about being overly precise, it's just that you hit in front of you. And we took and, and really kind of turned a machine gun into a, a sword. <laughs> so uh, normally when you shoot bullets they draw things called tracers and there's like hit detection lines uh, to see if you hit your enemy. So we did that but we made them, you know, just the length of the shorts, they would terminate at the certain length. And then as you do your swing, you're, you're sort of firing multiple bullets across. And that gives you the ability to have your actual swing path dictate your hit detection. Um, so that was kind of our core innovation that started the melee. So we got lucky enough that Age of Chivalry got put on Steam as one of the free mods that you could get in the early, early days of Steam. You know, it kind of blew up and it got really popular. And we we're like, okay, you know, up to this point, it was just a hobby project. And we we're, we're like, let's do this for real. And we found out pretty early we weren't going to be you know, allowed to use the source engine. So, and then we found out that the Unreal Engine was going to what they called the UDK, Unreal Developer Kit, which was a royalty-free um, or royalty structure, no upfront fee. Um, so for us, that was, hey, no barrier to entry here. And that's pretty much how we ended up making Chivalry into a real game. Chivalry Medieval Warfare was released in 2012, created by a remote team of 12, now going by Torn Banner who didn't get paid until the game launched and started selling. But much like Age of Chivalry, it found an audience. Arguably, it was creating an audience. And with each version of the game, the team was learning more and more about how to make this type of game. We share the view that our fans have largely of Chivalry 1, where it was a great game, but it had a ton more potential than it was able to capture. So in a sense, Chivalry 2 was a little bit of a revenge mission, um, coming back with more resources and, and you know, it's always been about making the ultimate medieval combat game. Today we're going to uncover the design of sword-based gameplay. And this comes in two forms, the soldier and the army. How does a game make being a soldier fun? Using weapons, understanding how to engage in fights, and making dying enjoyable. And what about the larger army? How does Chivalry 2 get you to feel like you're part of something bigger? How does it direct players and keep the pace engaging over large-scale maps? So, first things first, let's explore how they turn the average peasant 
into a bloodthirsty, sword-swinging maniac. Krah! You know, the most common complaint about fighting games is that there's the skill disparity and you just can't play with people who you're not in the same league with. Um, and you know, obviously first person shooters have a similar problem and we're putting them both together. So, you know, that, that's, that's a core challenge for us. And we for sure wanted to tackle it on across the spectrum in all the ways that you mentioned. We wanted to make sure that if you're no good at the combat at first, it's still fun. Um, so that's sort of the skill floor. But more than just the skill floor, you know, we want to make it so that you can get in a sword fight and you lose that sword fight. In the first Shiv one, you didn't even get the feeling that you're in a sword fight, you just die. Um, so we did a lot of core innovations to make it so you feel like there's an exchange, even if you lose that exchange, that you're getting the fantasy of, of sword play. And then also, you know, we wanted to make it so that dying was actually enjoyable because you're, you're going to die a lot in our game. It's a medieval like meat grinder. <laughs> We knew people were going to die a lot, a lot more in our game than other games even, and we wanted that to be fun. So that's where sort of like the ridiculousness and the, some of the Monty Python inspiration comes in. The basic thing is, you know, you're you're a medieval knight and you have your really heavy weapons, and, and the great sword is always the perfect example it brings to everyone new and recommend everyone new to play with as well. It's slow, it's heavy, does a lot of damage, and you can hit multiple opponents with it. There's a lot of finesse to the combat, and it's very accurate to the tracers. So our combat system is the animations um, that, that our animators create, where the swing, you know, literally uh, it informs how you're going to hit. Unlike most games, you you really have full control over your camera and the swing, and you can control it and manipulate it throughout as well. And that really is the key component of, of the combat. Turn into your swing and break them all with one shot. Good. So Shivery One was really a, just a timing-based uh, defense system. So you'd block, and they would just defend you, um, and that that worked, you know, relatively well. But Again, when you had a huge skill gap, it meant that you would just never block an attack of someone who was better than you. So you would never get an exchange, a flow. And all of the combat is built on this initiative system, which is sort of like a violent dance back and forth between the two players. Your every exchange, even if you don't deal damage, actually sets you up for your next move. So all of the timings, all of this is worked out really uh, intricately. And it's, it lets you chain your actions together in unique ways and sort of put your opponent in a position where you have an advantage. And so it really, the whole system can't, comes alive as you get better at the game and as you understand it. So we went to Shivery 2, we were like, okay, we need to make it so that players are, you know, at least able to participate in this dance. You know, at least you could see how you could get better. Games that attempt to simulate something come with their own set of design challenges, one of which is that while the systems themselves may be more complicated than your average game, players often want the more gamey and hand-holding aspects of the experience to be stripped back. That means stuff like in-game prompts and a cluttered user interface. But Chivalry 2 is a game that is telling the player a lot of things, far more than in the earlier games. So how did the team reach this design conclusion? It's a hard balance of, you know, how do we stick with a very minimal like medieval experience where we're not informing players with damage numbers or, or damage text, um, but also how do we make sure that everyone really understands and feels informed of what's going on when you have so many players as well, just relying on, you know, sound and animations is sometimes a struggle for you're just you're just surrounded. There's players everywhere. And I think because you see yourself in first person, you don't necessarily see what has happened to your character at all times. And that's a big challenge compared to third person or a fighting game, which we use for reference a lot. You see when you're interrupted and what that looks like. But when you just see your hands, it's hard to convey that you were you know, staggered and like you're, you're catching your breath. Um, so that's where it also comes in, of, you know, text pop-ups. You know, from a fighting game, you're looking at your character and they're looking at each other. But in our game, it, it's it's eye to eye. You know, you, you feel it's much more personal. It's much easier to pick up on what your opponent's doing, and that's why we wanted to provide more combat options because that's how you can you know express yourself with a different play style. And so as you get, it's not just as you see one player, but as you come to know the player you're fighting against, you can actually learn their strategies. So there's a lot of depth and variety in the combat. So 
So the very basics of understanding, you know, how the swings work when you get hits, that is very approachable. But then the more difficult the mechanics and the timings and the nuances of it, that is something that, you know, was a struggle in the first game. And uh, that's where we added a lot of the, you know, the text pop-ups or the UI elements to really tell you what happens, you know, what does being interrupted means or, you know, what does fainting mean? Uh, and those have really helped just in our own team during development, we found that um, people started using the terms across the team. It wasn't just me and Steve who understood the combat, but everyone started, you know, talking about things even internally. And that's how we knew that it worked. Visual cues are helpful, but in all the chaos, chivalry has to do a lot more to help the player understand what's going on. Much of it you may notice, but some tricks are a lot more subtle, especially when it comes to audio. Yeah, there's a ton of different audio um, systems that we have in place that make interactions you're involved with sound different from combat nearby. Because that was the first thing we noticed. We wanted really crunchy, uh, heavy impacts that just Rick really felt like you're smashing somebody with a medieval sword or a mace, you know. But then we realized, so if we do that, it's just if there's tons of people fighting around you, you can't tell what's happening with, with your fight. So there is this system that uh, exaggerates or adds sounds into exchanges you're involved with so that even in the midst of the, the meat grinder, you can get those combat cues and know what's going on. They have only 30 troops left. We are down to 10. And because of the way our combo system works, it's not um, like a fighting game where you hit a bunch of buttons in, in advance. Ours is like a free flowing combat system where as your sword is swinging, you know, you have until the last possible minute to make that decision of what your next move is. So the audio cues end up being the indicator to your opponent that you have made a change and they need to kind of look at you again. So it's kind of like use the ears to signal the eyes that they've got to update their information. It's one of those things that you pick up as you get used to the game more, but a lot of it comes down to like the contour of the animation, like the outline that the shape is making, because your peripheral picks up much faster than uh, the center of your eyes. And then so we use the audio and the peripheral vision stuff to try and trigger you that, hey, danger's coming. One of the greatest moments that we can capture because of this, in a gun game, you don't get this sense generally, but in a sword game, there's this moment of anticipation, or sometimes you just know, you know that you're gonna die, it's a quarter of a second and you you just whiffed your swing so you can't defend yourself and it's coming and then you get smashed and we actually find players love that experience they love to know that's a really clear reinforcement i've made a mistake and then of course the, the head comes off and the blood spurts everywhere and it's just this really satisfying event ah! Ah! you know we found before that that having sounds be radial um, actually reduces the amount of information in certain cases. So some of our uh, sounds have like a cone uh, base to them so that you can tell the person's looking at you. Because if they're just running by behind you, it doesn't really matter as much as if they're running at you. Right, so we do things like that. And same with the projectiles. When the projectiles come near you, um, you'll hear the uh, so that you know it was a near miss. We do a lot of things that are based on your position and the angle that things are coming at you. Because on the audio side for us, it's all about separating it's just this constant base level of just armor smashing and people screaming and dying. And like, how do I get any information out of this chaos? You know, the amount of grunts and screams that we have recorded for every voice actor is, is probably excessive by most game standards. And there's different kinds of grunts that we, you know, we try to direct the voice actors to you know, do this kind of grunt for when you're, you know, lunging forward and starting a swing. We scale them with different pain levels and, and different things that we know as well. Um, and it's something in general that we want to keep as, as a big thing to inform, you know, the player of what's going on. So, you know, there's always a commander telling you what to do in the objective maps. Brothers, the town square is nearly lost. You know, what is the story? What are we doing? What do you need to do as the soldier? Um, so both from the objectives in, in the levels and into the combat, we make sure that, you know, the VO and the voices is one of the main communication points for how you understand the game. Oh, 
Okay, we can't talk about the audio in this game without mentioning the role of voiceover in Chivalry 2. And yes, the screaming button. There aren't many games that have a dedicated button for screaming, but what may surprise you is that the inclusion of all this chatter and screaming and even the emotes, they're not just for the memes. They're actually a crucial part of the wider design of Chivalry 2, a way of making you, sitting alone at home, feel connected to both your fellow soldiers and the wider battle. Yeah, I think it's the importance of multiplayer, the importance of knowing that there's another person there having that experience. And that's where so much of the VO and the role playing comes into it because these battle cries, they become incredibly contagious. It's not just the battle cries, the laughter, the taunts, the insulting people. What other game is gonna let you quote Shakespeare and kill someone with a chicken? You know, that's kind of a, <laughs> our approach to it. We just, we wanna give you the whole spectrum of the medieval fantasies. So I think the, the camaraderie in the game is the one that we can't get across in trailers, really. Um, so, you know, when you battle cry because you're running out from spawn and like the people next to you and we always spawn people in groups so that you can get that feeling. And a lot of the humor and that kind of stuff, I think we can sell in trailers and get people a general sense. But the camaraderie and the interactions with other players, that is really one that you can only really experience in, in the game, I think. Okay, Recruit, we've talked about how the developers at Torn Banner can turn you into somewhat of a soldier. Now let's explore the other side of this design coin, the battlefield. The maps in Chivalry 2 are pretty long, taking around 30 to 40 minutes to complete, which when you think about it is a fairly long time to spend screaming, swinging a sword and chopping people's arms off. So how does the game attempt to keep you engaged in all this intense action? There's a lot to unpack here, from the pacing of the encounters, to level design, storytelling, even including the tone of the experience. To explain this, let's start where Torn Banner Studios did, at the beginning of the battle. Adrian Khan stood and bled for us! Now he rests here in peace! Hurry with me. The heathen horde is at our holy gates! Protect Phaedrin's tomb and the holy city of Galancourt! Protect the city of Galancourt and safeguard Phaedrin's tomb! And so we have this like core medieval movie influence. And then we also really don't like uh, the way that some games go about becoming super gamey, um, where the objectives are point A and point B, and they don't even try and pretend there's like a real in-world meaning to these things. So we want you to feel like you're on the on the battlefield, like emotionally. But games tend to not do that so well. I think games tend to, you know, just have this artificial layer between you and the experience. There's a lore behind the game, and then every map has an actual real-world context within the battle that's going on between two factions, coming up with a scenario, and starting you in that scenario and having you play through it all the way. So how we got to peasants was one of the things that medieval armies do is they just slaughter. They just they just go in and, and sort of make an example out of an area. Right, and so what does that look like? Well, it looks like you're working in the fields and then all of a sudden this army comes screaming over the hill and you've got a hoe or a shovel or a pitchfork and you just, you know, you've got 30 seconds to see what you can do. <laughs> and the whole point of that is it's not balanced. We kind of think of them a little bit like the pistol round in Counter-Strike before anybody can afford better weapons, there's pistols. And so there's that's kind of what that first uh, clash is. The moments that you get are that the unique memories of you know, I killed I killed a knight as a peasant, you know, or I was just slaughtered instantly and, and, and trampled, like, <laughs> both are great. You know, what would a medieval army actually do if they came into this space? That's always our mindset for the kind of objectives, and we, it takes a ton of work to, to handcraft a new game mode for every stage of the map. I mean, our maps are like seven maps stitched together, and we come up with new game modes for each one of them. And the reason we do that is so that it feels like a real place that you can put yourself in and you're running through the streets, stealing the loot, killing the peasants. Um, that's what it's all about, movie scene. Now, when we look at our references or movies, there's always, you know, the story to it. You're not just on the field, but there's a reason to be on the field. So when we started one of our first maps, which is uh, Warden Glade, it's just an open field, and that we thought that was the best start and it's the simplest, you know, just pure combat. But even there, we make sure that we started with a battle speech. 
everyone's lined up and then you rush into battle so we get that kind of brave heart reference for it basically so in every map you know we just we want that immersion in the world and not just to be fighting for fighting sake i think one of the things that can maybe be hard to even realize when you're in the game is the pacing changes that, that we had you maybe you start in an open field and then it gets into a really chaotic really tight and claustrophobic area and if you always played that you know, tight experience. You would tire out in 15 minutes, can't handle it anymore. Yeah, pacing becomes hugely important, especially because these map experiences are, you know, between half an hour and 45 minutes that the player's playing. So you need to change the pacing throughout so that not a one note experience, right? So we found uh, it's crazy fun to take 64 players and put them all in a tiny space and make them just kind of grind it out for a little bit and then it gets it gets too much and you want to kind of break it off more. So in something like Lion Spire, that's a, one of our maps, you start out and, and the first experience is you're on this big wide beach and there's a ton of space, so it's very wide open, but there's like this big clash and then people are spread out and you get these one-on-one -on -one duels happening everywhere. And then once the ram gets to the gate, it, it, all the combat goes and everybody's all in one spot. And it's just about, you know, just kind of American football kind of just grinding out those extra couple of yards. And then the gate comes down and it opens up again. And so that's a good example of how throughout the level we're trying to do like hourglass kind of shapes to, to play with the pacing. It's almost like a water pressure concept of how narrow are we making the spaces in order to increase the pressure that players are experiencing, the chaos. Here's an area of game design we don't often get to talk about, but one that's crucial to keeping the pace of a game like Chivalry, the respawn system. Behind the curtain, Chivalry 2 is doing a lot to ensure that players charge each other in groups instead of wandering aimlessly around the battlefield. So one of the worst feeling things is when there's a ton of defenders and the attackers just trickle in one on one and get swarmed and eaten every time. Um, so we do a lot of work with the spawn system to make it so that you know, there's spawn waves that come and we spawn groups of people all at once. That's why there's not you know, a single uh, respawn timer. When you die, it's a bit variable so that we can clump people and you come in as a, as a force to be reckoned with rather than um, you know, just a raindrop against an ocean. It's uh, one of the unique things that we picked up right away that you know, not many games do, is that we start people running. You don't spawn and then you kick up running. We start you like running at full speed, you're charging into battle. Uh, and that helps enormously in keeping the pace up, feeling like there's no downtime for the player. And um, of course there's, you know, the usual stuff and making sure that the paths look clear. Uh, but a big thing is that we try to create the vistas where you always see you know, where you're going or where people are fighting. And just seeing people fight in the distance, that's all you need. The rest is just, you know, bonus on top of that. But if you see someone fighting, that's where you're bolting. Uh, and that's where we spawn you bolting in the direction of. That's one thing we really tried to improve in Shivery 2 over Shivery 1, is the amount of downtime. The reason people stop playing games is some mixture of downtime and frustration points. Um, and so what we try and do is make sure that the experience, we look at what the average experience is and what sort of the ends of the spectrum are in terms of how long uh, you're running and how long you're before you respawn. And those values are all very tightly tuned and the whole maps had to be reworked many times as we were figuring this out in the first place. Because first person shooter players are the most picky people in the world in terms of pacing and when it comes to this, if they're just sitting on the sidelines for long enough, let's go quit and play something else. So we knew we had to keep the pace high. We knew we had to get people to run in, die, and run back in and feel like that was something that, um, you know, you're spending most of your time fighting rather than traveling and being dead. So playing with how long people are dead versus how long they're running in in different stages is sort of how we, you know, I talked about how the width affects the water pressure but that's how we affect the depth between the two teams. The width is sort of how much are people fighting in a group versus one-on-one, -on -one. and then the depth compression is more just how much time are people fighting versus running. Um, and we play with that so that if there's, you know, an experience where one team's supposed to be overwhelming the other one, or that they're spawning faster, that there's, there, there's pressure from, you know, the attackers more than defenders. And we do the opposite in other, other cases. <laughs> Thank you.
We've spent most of our time here talking about the ways in which this game guides the player, how they train you to be a soldier and make sure that you always know where you're meant to be during the battle. But all of this control is in service of a greater freedom. It's what allows Torn Banner to take their hands off when it matters most. To allow soldiers of all skill levels to create beautiful emergent moments in this bloodthirsty sandbox and create stories that will echo through the ages. Uh, I love a lot of the VIPs because the players can dictate the strategy and it's like killing the king. It's just the, the climax worked really well. And where the VIP goes, the rest of the team has to dynamically adapt to that. Yeah, my, my favorite one has been the, the falling traps when, when players don't realize that, a, you know, the, the, the body that is hanging by the news, when you shoot it, it falls down. And that's the kind of surprises that I love that we were able to work in. You know, I, I love the break in combat that an oil pot creates, where it's just, you know, it's just the fire, everyone just scatters and, and has to redirect. It's actually really funny, if you turn the gore off, because you can do that, um, the, the heads are just cabbages. <laughs> but you can get, uh, in the world, you can find cabbages too, and food's fun because if you battle cry while holding it, you can eat it and heal, but you can also just lob uh, tomatoes and apples and cabbages at people and kill them with that. We, we kind of just wanted like anything that you could pick up, uh, you could you could hit people with. My arm! Where's my arm? It's about putting the players into the narrative so that they're writing it, getting the game out of the way. We're not trying to be the funny ones. We're trying to make the player the funny ones. We're trying to make the player the ones who tell the story based on what happened. That's what creates memories, is these unique story moments where these crazy things happen and you, you can laugh about it for years. So integrating people to the narrative is so that they can write their own stories. Thank you for watching this video on Chivalry 2, and thank you to all the beautiful people here. Names are apparently flying past my visage, who funded this entire effort. <laughs> can, I, can I drop the accent? I should keep the accent for the sake of consistency. Um, thank you to everyone who supports us on patreon.com slash noclip. It is you who allows us to afford such um, <laughs> beautifully crafted, uh, realistic looking Halloween costumes like this one and this uh, fine sword, which is actually quite heavy, which was made in uh, China, <laughs> no less. <laughs> thank you to the armies of China for supplying us with this um, this beautiful beast. Um, if you would like to subscribe to us, that would be terrific. We'd really appreciate it. We also have a podcast channel you might not know about, uh, youtube.com slash noclip podcast. And of course, if you become a patron, don't forget that uh, you also get lots of goodies, lots of, lots of freebies, things like podcasts, extra ones, extra videos, behind the scenes things, a lot of other updates and, and shite, which probably is a bit old now, but th there's a lot of good things in there as well. And you'll help us poor independent film <laughs> creators make high production value pieces like this. Also, we are currently saving up for a recreational vehicle <laughs> so we can travel the world and affect other parts of the United States with our curious brand of infotainment. Thank you so much for watching. My voice is about to break, so we better stop. For Agatha!